Hey, thank you for tuning in to another episode of Cannabis Legalization News. If you like Virginia and you are an entrepreneur that wants to get in the cannabis industry, this is the show for you. Now, maybe you don't remember, but uh, the Virginia statute that they passed uh, last year does have a lot of social equity built into it. But now what's going to happen? Uh, so we're going to be talking with Paul from the Virginia, Mi Mi Virginia Minority Cannabis Coalition and discussing the status of Virginia cannabis licenses on another episode of Cannabis Legalization News. Uh, remember, you have to be 21 plus to get into the industry. And we'll talk to you soon. Paul, thank you for joining us. Mickey, how are you doing? Good. Happy Sunday, everybody. Same Happy you, Sunday. Mickey. Yeah. It's uh, another one, you know, I'd say smash the likes, click subscribe, but there's a high likelihood you've already subscribed. Uh, Paul, <laughs> what have you been seeing in the, how long have you been involved in the Virginia cannabis movement? That's you know, still, it's still coming. It's not there yet, in my opinion. I mean, they passed yeah, it, but it's still it not is, there. It's uh, the way I'd describe it is it's like the politicians are putting together a Frankenstein business. It's like we're getting an idea yep. from over here, and we like this over here. Let's stick it together and see what we get. And unfortunately, that does not work as well as like planning out everything from soup to nuts from day one. So, you know, where Virginia is and what they're trying to do and what we're looking at, it is there's a lot of indefinites because of how equity has become such a scary word so hmm. you know we got a lot of work ahead of us you're right and uh this is gonna we have another election coming up here in the state so we're we're about to walk into another another serious uh year of activity educating people because still i just came from a speaking opportunity to let about 200 people know about an event we have coming up in a couple weeks. And it's amazing how we're years into this industry in the state and some people don't even know that it is like legal and they don't have any concept or understanding of how that benefits them. When right. you say years, do you mean including hemp? No, I'm talking about Virginia cannabis because we've had the medical industry here for some time mm. but what ended up happening it was originally created for children with epilepsy and then wow. in the last uh like four years or so uh it's been broadened as more knowledgeable legislators have gotten into state government and it has expanded out to where now uh, like as of July 1, if you go through the process to get a medical card in the state of Virginia, you can go right across the street and use that card that day. Mm. When I got my card last year, it was a process you go through, you meet, and then you have to get all your paperwork to the state. And then it was like a 90 day waiting process for an actual card to come in the mail. So that's been condensed down to now you get an email. But uh, as of July 1, in less than 30 days, it's going to change to where it's immediate. So see, that kind of nice. stuff, people don't have an, a clue. And they don't realize they don't, they don't have to keep buying dirty, hot products from the legacy market. You mm. know, you can get, you can't be, the way the state of Virginia is set up, you can't be turned down for a cannabis car. What, what but is there supply? Yeah. Is there supply though? Like, are there? Because I don't know of any. I don't think Cresco's in Virginia. What are the operators in Virginia farming or growing the the cannabis? Is there any, or are there any? There's five medical licenses in the state. Oh, that's terrible. That's like I'm basically saying, like, you know, there's there's like five monopolies, or like there's a cartel. You know, well, not quite, not quite, and that and that's why I, I say Virginia is so different. And I'll explain. There's five medical licenses that were originally uh, set up. And I'll explain to you the story about how I found out about that originally, because that's that's a whole nother conversation uh, about how that came about. But there's five available, only four are active, uh, because one of the companies that is out in Danville on the western side of the state, I believe, 
uh, their company basically dissolved before they even got to market. Damn. So wow. that that was, and then I've heard a lot of different stories, but I don't know the details about that. So the reason I say I won't view that as a monopoly is because one of the companies, and well, actually two of them, but one of them here locally in Portsmouth, right across the river from where I'm sitting right now, was one of the first organizations medical MSOs that heard about what we were doing as an organization and put up some funds to help us go out into the black and brown community and teach people how to get into this industry on a low level entrepreneur level to basically be a competing competing dispensary owner cultivator and so forth so you know the Virginia is different than some other places because of the, you know, the long-term agricultural background. But the thing that is disappointing is it's still a state that likes to embrace large corporations. This mm. is a tobacco state. You, you get what I'm saying? This is a, yeah. a government contract state, you know? So, <laughs> you know, this is a large employer state. It sounds it's, like it's going to be expensive to do the application. You're going to need a complete application. So when you have that type of stuff, now we're talking about they can use the regulations and then the process. And uh, we need to talk about how we can have this more open because there's only so many licenses that are built into the rubric according to Virginia's law. But you got to remember, too, because of how the legislative process fell apart back in February, the law that was originally put in motion is incomplete. So there are some things that were supposed to become finalized in this legislative year that did not. That would have created some obstacles for minorities. Uh, so that's a good thing. So this is what has basically happened is we're in a holding pattern for a year. Wow. Nothing really changes. Uh, there, there are several uh, medical MSOs here in the state that we have been talking to about helping to support some equity initiatives. Mm. <coughs> mm -hmm. We've gotten a lot of feedback on that. But like I said, our first boot camp that we did last year was all about getting people into the industry uh, at a grassroots level. So Virginia, because it is not completely framed up yet, there's a lot of opportunity for some things to be done right. I'm not going to say correct. I'm going to say right. And when I say right, I mean <clears throat> it, the aesthetics and the optics of it look right for the state. Uh oh, yeah, and, yeah. and the other side to that is if they do the right thing, they don't have to worry about it because there's so much upside. One of the biggest right. things... I, when I hear people in the state, especially Republican politicians and conservatives say uh, equity should not be a part of this, but black and brown people make up the bulk of the people that have been incarcerated for cannabis in the state. What's the percentage in Virginia? In Illinois, it's about 3x over. And so that's, I always say like in your base rate, what is your base rate for your equity plans? Well, And so like, it, how, do you, how do you set? how many licenses should be given out to the equity? And then also, why are we controlling the number of licenses anyway? Well, there's a there's so many things you just mentioned in that. So let's yeah. kind of hit them one by one. Uh, in terms of the number of licenses, the original numbers were set for uh, the medical MSOs, but in terms of adult after that, mm -hmm. that's completely wide open. That's what has to be framed up in this next legislative process. So that's why our organization is trying to educate the public as to what it equity looks like, what would be fair, not just for the people who have been incarcerated and fighting, you know, the, the prohibition of cannabis, but also what looks just looks fair for the tax base in the state. Ec I mean, uh, economic boom for everyone, because there's more than enough money. And you were talking about the base numbers and the stats. Virginia as a state has done more research about cannabis as an industry, as a state before opening up adult use than anyone else in the country. They've been studying it for a long time. And the sad, I guess I could say sad, but also positive thing is their own numbers that they have gotten back that they shared. Cause I was involved with the work group process with the last governor that set up the first half of this legal law. So the numbers that we were <clears throat> shared 
through all the research the state did, it was pretty scary. And they recognized that. The state recognized we need to address this. Different administration, different time also. This was pre-COVID. What's the, uh, the scary part, Paul? It's like this. There are more Caucasian people that get um, charged mm -hmm. for cannabis possession in the state of Virginia. However, if you are black or brown, you are four times more likely to go to jail. Now, when you so guys you're talk more likely to be convicted. Yes. One of the things yeah. like, I think uh, when I look at all the states that are doing social equity, I think there's New Jersey and everybody else sucks. And so uh, with New Jersey, they focus on the cannabis conviction anywhere in the United States. Therefore, the dormant commerce clause lawsuits that I could file were like I could file them in New York, I could file them in Illinois, I could file them maybe in Virginia one day. We'll find out. I could file them mm -hmm. in Connecticut. Uh, but I can't file that in New York, in, in New Jersey, because it is a cannabis conviction anywhere in the United States, a federal or state. And so if you look at those numbers as well, in Illinois, our base rate appears to be 45 percent black and brown, because if you look at the arrest records in our state, they're about three to three point five times more likely to be uh, arrested. Mm -hmm. And ours is just the arrest. It doesn't look at further into that. So I'm not sure about it once we go to conviction. Mm -hmm. But um, it's about 14, 15 percent of the state's population. But now they're be getting about 45 percent of the licenses. So it really is focusing on the equity portions of how many people were literally hurt by this law. Man, let me share a couple of things with you and get a little bit more granular on these stats. Nice. And, and how this kind of works. In the state of Virginia, like I said, the, that's the the arrest versus conviction. The other part to this that's very scary is I was on a work group meeting a couple years ago with several people representing different state agencies, and they were explaining that the number two employer in the state were, was the prison system. So that's, Wow. Yeah, number two employer in the state, the prison system. When mm. you drive away from the coast and you get further into the state, in the middle of the state, in the Shenandoah Valley, there's a quite a few prisons. It's something like every 40 miles or so, there's a prison. Prisons are private industry. That's a lot of employment where you got somebody making 55 grand a year, basically controlling somebody that got arrested for a joint. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't understand the policy precept, the foundation. It's like if we're looking at just the fundamentals of why we do things and why we have laws privatization of prisons makes literally no sense none at all yeah none like, at all. you want a profit margin in crime is yeah. what you're saying you want to incentivize crime because that's the only way you make money yeah now let me share this with you this is what another thing that was scary by when it, i read this in a couple of these studies the state I done a study and it was uh, it was showing the results and it was talking about people that have been arrested for cannabis possession on the road, like traffic violation, they mm. got pulled over for speeding, something like that mm -hmm. by a state trooper, a state police officer. When they looked at those situations and those numbers, the bulk, and I mean the bulk, something like 80, some, 82 percent or something like that of the people in the state that got arrested for cannabis possession on the road, on the highway, came from three counties. Oh, damn. What? Three counties. And then there's, again... Now, there's, there's think so about much that. prosecutorial <laughs> discretion, and there's so much local yeah. home rule in this country. Think about this, because wow. in these counties, there's a highway, there's Highway 85, 95, and Highway 58. Does a that judge or prosecutor own stock in a private prison in a private prison that operates and in one of these you, countries? You would, you would wonder because the, when you start reading some of these numbers, <laughs> get into the details. Okay, you got those three highways, and then if you look at the majority of African Americans that have been arrested on the highway for cannabis possession are in that grouping, and when you expand out a map of those highways. If you look at the outer loop of those highways, there's nothing but HBCUs that have all been in mm. athletic conferences. And mm. I've had this conversation after I learned this information. I had this conversation with our board members for the coalition. Uh, several of them are involved in high level education and other things. So this is some very interesting info. But when you start looking at that, 
there's a ton of HBCUs in the outer loop of that circle. And from the kids traveling back and forth to schools during football and basketball season, yeah. police officers would see a, ki- a car with three or four dark-skinned people in the car pull the car over. And because there was there was no law in place to prevent people being targeted for driving while black, cop could come up to the car and say, hey, as soon as you let the window down, I smell the tinge of marijuana. I need to search your car. Yeah. Now, if it's two o'clock in the morning, you're driving back to Northern Virginia, you're driving back to Hampton from Washington, D.C., and your friends are in the car and the cop pulls you over, it's two in the morning. Are you going to argue with that police officer? Or are you going to no. say, okay, you know, you haven't, you just got in your car. Yeah. But you yeah. do not remember right. the beer can in the trunk from a party two weeks ago or the joint mm. in the ashtray that your roommate left in there from the night before. And that's yeah. the kind of stuff that police officers are used. Now, the sad thing is, is that I don't know if they're still up, but there used to be several anonymous law enforcement message boards where the police officers were actually detailing how they would entrap people. Oh, sure. Yeah, it's terrible. They are not your friends. And you do have a Sixth Amendment right to say, I want to talk to a lawyer and then yeah. just be quiet. I'd like to talk to a lawyer. Am I being arrested? Yep. The Pop Brothers at Law have this down to a T, and I don't do anything related. Like, I got a call the other day from somebody who got popped for a cannabis crime in the Chicagoland area, and I'm like, all right, let me make a referral. Uh, I should probably just teach myself how to pr- do criminal law and be like, that'll be $40,000. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, damn. I mean, cops can fucking lie to you. That's the unfortunate thing, right? Like, the, the, the law is in their favor. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, at least they don't. At least they don't hear about them beating confessions out of people anymore, like they used to before. <laughs> like we had video cameras everywhere. But no, see, that's just, the thing: right. the last governor put a law in place, got a law passed, to where cops can't walk up to the car talking about the smell of marijuana. They can't touch you in your car. You know what I'm saying? I can have an ounce of weed as long as it's not open and I can't reach into it, and it's not already yeah. sparked and it's sitting there. Cop can't mess with you. But the public does not understand that and does not believe that, and that protects them. So that's I'm going back to what we started out talking about. That's why the whole education piece mm. is so important, and that's why our organization has moved towards doing events that are education based, but it's basically set in an entertaining environment to where it's fun, not some sort of lecture, because. People got to be made aware. We're trying to educate people before legislation time comes back around. So did people you, can understand. Did you see the uh, the bus arrest in Georgia? Or not arrest, but they're pulled over and they searched through all the girls' yes. uh, soccer yes. team? It's funny you mentioned that. One hey. of, I went to an HBCU. I'm a graduate of Hampton University, greatest yeah. university in the state of Virginia. <laughs> and... It's funny you mention that because one of my board members is also a Hampton grad. Mm-hmm. Um, and another one of my board members is a third generation North Carolina a and grad. His dad has, was the band instructor there for 30 years, is known all over the planet. Mm. When that story came out, the two of them contacted me because one, one of my board members, if I'm not mistaken, knows the coach of that team. Oh, damn. And had gotten a phone call already. By the time it came out on the net, he had already talked to them and was aware of it. Yeah. The other thing, though, is my other board member that went to A&T was an athlete for North Carolina. Carolina A&T ran track for them. So he had talked about traveling on buses, driving through Alabama and stuff (laughs) like this happening. And we're talking about in like. 89, 92. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's back when it was. Yeah. There's nobody sharing shit on Snapchat back in 82. No. Or like, uh, like nobody's like, just like, did you see that on Twitter? He was live streaming it. Yeah. That did not exist. And so yeah, like. You didn't uh, have that phone protection and insurance in place. And right. that was that was some scary stuff. Because I just yeah. thought about how to get in. The, I mean, just when you're, you're like, man, you really got to be a, a closed minded individual to really think. A Why the hell do you have to hate somebody and then go injure them? Well, what the this, fuck is wrong with you? You know, uh, I mean, that's kind of like my point, too, is like where I, where I was going with the, the buses. Is, it, you know, I mean, and again, thankfully, everybody has cameras and things like that, but also the, the body cams when they release the footage. You know, if you listen to these cops talking there, I mean, 
it's the same shit that you hear from all the cops. Like, we, we're not looking for any weed. You know, a little weed's no big deal. But how about you fucking legalize it? Stop harassing people <laughs> yeah. and, and stop pulling right. people over for a smell. Well, like, you consider a little. You yeah. Know what I'm it's like, that's all relative to the person. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like, like the half this bullshit pantering that cops talk about, like, oh, you know, we're not, we're only looking for real criminals. Well, I don't know what to tell that's you. Look at, yeah, yeah, find a real place Man. to go look for. Man, that's the kind of stuff that, uh, perfect example. That's the kind of stuff that at this event in June, this because the event is called the Cannabis Opportunity Movement. Because cool. we are creating a movement to empower people through education to understand that shit yeah. before it happens. Because that's happening every day, but people don't realize. They can say, no, nah, that's okay. Nope, you're not going to search my car. You're not going to do this. You can't even pull me over for this. Unless yeah. you see me actually driving with a joint in my mouth. Yeah, right. You can't pull me over for weed in the state of Virginia. I have to physically be consuming. Yep. Yeah. I'm going to try to see if I can get, because uh, I, I like to program stuff, you know, and uh, yeah. can I, uh, if I say Google, call my lawyer, can I make it make my phone ring? That would be hilarious. Uh, but uh, it, it's one of those deals where you can say, and that's happened to me, like the, the real interesting calls are for whatever reason, Google will make me uh, get called for people's lawyers when it's like they can't talk. And so they're sign language to somebody. And so you're talking through an interpreter. And it's really neat. And you're like, wow, everybody wants to get into this industry. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's difficult. And so, like, if you were going to, like, it just from costs. I mean, like, you just, because social equity doesn't magically make costs go away. Yeah. Uh, and then, like, to open a compliant dispensary with the, that's heavily regulated, like it's a casino, like it's a bank, you know, like in the sense that they need so much security. You need access control doors, fire particular uh, fire grade aspects to those doors, odor mitigation, all this type of stuff. So you're talking about a million dollar build out to, to open a dispensary. And that would be like not a huge dispensary. And of course, not a tiny dispensary, but just like an average one. Mm -hmm. How do we how do we get that to work, though? Because usually there's a gulf between equity and right. capital. And yeah. let's, let's talk about that because that's one of the things um, that my my the current cohort of boot camp graduates mm. they are a couple steps of you know in that process deeper than the new people we got coming on board with this no new cohort. Well, the way we view it, when I say we, I mean us as a coalition and what I have worked to put in place for our people that participate through our program is. From the people that I've talked to around the country that have had success with equity initiatives, not all of them from the state in terms of licensing, but there's parts of the country where there's organi private organizations putting money into uh, social equity applicants' hands to help them. But they're not giving them all of that million dollars because no one wants to be on the hook for that million dollars. Yeah. So in a lot of states, you'll see where, especially California, They'll do these 5149 partnerships. And the person having the 51% has uh, you know, has the ownership, but none of the money. And the person that is the minority owner puts up all the money. That is the worst business model possible. It might sound good to someone that's never fucking run a business mm -hmm. and has never had to deal with finding a customer. Mm. It's difference being a business owner and an entrepreneur. A business right. owner, I can go buy everything I need and just stick it in there, and it's great. An entrepreneur, yeah. every idea comes from your noodle, and that takes a lot more effort, time, and energy, and often money. So what we have done with our boot campers is we've taught them to structure their business plan so they can take advantage of staged funding. So Ooh. the first part in the process, and keep in mind, the final details of how they can capitalize on this and how we can deploy is truly going to depend on how the state lines up the licensing process yeah right now it's very likely that it will be multiple pools of lotteries so that everyone has an opportunity to take advantage but there is no one being excluded and then there's a correction point that's the current most popular uh rational people in the gamification of a limited licensing structure where they're trying to create a cartel now uh, like again there's the there's what new jersey's doing in my opinion when it comes to social equity and all the other states find something yeah. about virginia 
okay? Virginia is not saying we need, we're only going to have this many licenses. That is, this is what I'm trying to get you to say. Mm. Or see, I want to go back to that percentage of ownership. One of the things that was in place before they totally botched up the legislation was instead of being 51, it was more like 65. But the way that could be structured, it was more beneficial for the person putting up the money. So the problem in a lot of these areas is the people that put the rules to how these businesses can be assembled mm -hmm. had no freaking idea how to assemble a small business. With, right, they're politicians. Hmm. Exactly. They, weren't, they weren't business owners or entrepreneurs. Exactly, yeah. they never dealt with that stuff. So, cause I've sat down and talked with some of them about having stages of funding and they're like, well, what does that mean? So for instance, some of the social equity applicants that we have taken through our boot camp, they have for the last six to eight months been talking to some of their family members that have worked for the shipyard, that have worked in successful blue collar jobs, put money away for retirement, and have talked to them and started pooling together that yeah. first stage of 50 grand. So they got family members that can be patient that give them some seed capital to get started. Now, the reason why I did this is because when I was out at MJ Biz, in Las Vegas last year, I met a couple guys from Oakland and San Fran that had gotten, you know, involved in the industry uh, through some equity initiatives. And I asked because they were they had just gotten some of their money, like within 30 days of me meeting them. So mm. they were excited and I was great to talk with them about that process. And I asked them, what was one of the biggest challenges just getting the funding from outside of their warm market? And it was crazy because I'm sitting here talking to four people and two of them almost say the same words simultaneously. And they're from two different parts of California. They both said, when I didn't have any money at all, investors treated me like shit. But when I got 20 grand, and then one of the guys said, his 20 grand came from his city. Mm, right. The city gave him $20,000 to spend because they liked the plan and there were several other people in this initiative. Yep they were trying to put forward and when he got that 20 grand some of the people that he had talked to as investors trying to get real you know pockets for months before that yeah saw him on the news read about him on the paper came back to make an offer but it was a completely different thing because they realized okay this dude is not necessarily dependent on me he's not a pawn you know he's, he's an entrepreneur exactly. he's got skin in the game and so like one of the things people are like how come you charge 500 dollars for your social equity incubator i'm like because i make sure that we go through your evidence and we have a nice stack that you could submit to your state that's going to prove that your social equity plus it means that your first money i'm going to make a promissory yeah. note from your company to you because you put in you get yes. paid out first you have to understand it from an ownership perspective yes you know as opposed to i'm just this guy perspective yes. i'm just so fortunate that this investor was willing <laughs> to give me this million dollars i just was arrested i lived in the right place i'm social equity yeah. hell no look man y'all gotta understand something i'm the child of two business owners all right so my dad was the first black kid from his high school to get an athletic scholarship mm. in Saginaw, nice. Michigan. My mom was the first black female doctor in the state of Wisconsin. She went to undergrad and medical school on academic scholarship. Paul didn't have that brain and I knew that she was not happening for me, you know, but business gravitated to it because of my relationship with my dad. But because of that, I have beat our boot campers and our participants over the head about no matter what you got to have a solid business model because you got to be able to compete in a very competitive industry so yeah. you got a half-baked idea and yeah i'm gonna do this and everybody's gonna support me because i'm the only black business in this part of town you're gonna be gravely mistaken <laughs> yep. because you're gonna go broke very quickly because you gotta build a business that yes you have your core customer but no matter what you have to have a solid business idea mm -hmm. and that is why we have taken this approach and that's why i say some of the stuff you've mentioned about these other parts of the country and how jacked up it is spot on but that's really that's the shit that scared several of these virginia politicians because it's like this fellas if virginia was to do some really jacked up shit in like three years from now 
Virginia cannabis looks like Illinois or like LA, stuff like that, or you know, like Oklahoma, where there's actually like no equity involved at all, you know, stuff like that. That's a really dumb thing to do in an election year in a state where slavery was created and you have all these universities, you have 23 military bases. You understand what I'm saying? You have tons of professional athletes that have been born within 30 miles of where I'm sitting who are in the all of the halls of fame. Sports, very relevant in this area, but now there's an opportunity for that same community to rise up economically through something that they have been targeted for. Yeah. Right. You're saying, no, we can't include you. Well, oh, no. Yeah. That's... That doesn't seem biased. Mm. No, it, it also, like, if you don't include them, then you're susceptible to that dormant commerce clause legal exactly. challenge. And so if it's actually baked into the cake, not just at the, the state level, but at the federal level, you're allowed to discriminate. Well, why? Because remember last century when we passed all these laws to discriminate against these people? Yeah, right. Uh, and so they were disproportionately harmed, and that gives them an equity holding. I'm not yeah. just saying it was black and brown people. Hippies were involved, Jews, yeah. uh, other people that were different that they could use to get out of the system, you know? Exactly. Paul, what do you so what what does equity look like in Virginia? Like, you know, I, I know you mentioned, you mentioned Oklahoma, and, and and to me, I think Oklahoma still represents a a fair capitalist market uh, as far as like you know it's it's an equal opportunity for everybody, right? And, mm -hmm. and you're saying there's going to be like three rounds in in Virginia, so is does does an equity applicant can begin in those first couple rounds? How how are they going to involve equity? What, what what's their plans? The state, okay, it's like this. In the state of Virginia, the governor has said that he doesn't like the word equity. They're trying to- Is this the same guy who on day one wrote like a non-binding executive order that says, we will not teach critical race theory in our schools? Yes. Yeah, yes. you guys You guys elected a turd sandwich. It sucks. Yeah. Same guy. Now, I, I got to tell you, I think he was surprised that he actually won. Um, <laughs> for like the first month, like I'm on the I'm on the third cannabis board, the cannabis equity reinvestment board for the state, where we hmm. are written into the law, and 30 percent of the tax revenue is supposed to come to this board, and we can reallocate it into the community where we see fit. Hmm. There you go. Okay. Now, when so, like you said, soon as he got in office. There was this whole list of, we got to do this, 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 tick all these boxes. One of the things that they immediately tried to do is take that 30% away. Mm. Saying mm. that money, you know, the state is stretched and that money needs to go back to the general fund. Mm -mm. And it ends up coming out that the general fund it actually has a surplus. And so, what the heck is, hey, how do they fund schools in your guys' yeah. state? They fund them in our state by property taxes. What the fuck is that? That just yeah. disproportionately benefits rich people with good public schools. And they're like, well, my kids went to public school. Your property taxes are nine grand a year, Bob. Virginia. Yeah. Virginia, it, Virginia has been slow to embrace sin money. Now, let me, mm. let me explain what I mean. In the state of Virginia, gambling from a casino level has not happened yet. It's actually in the process. There is an Indian tribe that has won multiple court cases and they're opening up a casino in downtown Portsmouth, one of the prime locations right on the river. And there's another organization opening up another casino. If you if you are in a boat or if you could walk, it's literally a five minute walk across the water and they're putting another casino in Norfolk. You can see the shore from these two cities that's how close it is now that process of getting those casino go going took like 10 years okay mm. so that's how long that's been in motion and now those casinos are supposed to open in the next couple years i'm saying this because virginia was so slow to get into cannabis that's why it did it through the epilepsy you know for yeah. kids. we're gonna take it real real slow but what has happened is people have seen how the money is generated in other places and has gotten their interest to where they're like, okay, we got to try and get into this money because they're, they're expecting it to be so much money in cannabis because that's what you see on TV, right? No, no. <laughs> if you watch the stock prices, they've just been straight, you know, just straight down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 70% of their, their value. Yeah. Why that guy 
on Narcos and the guy playing Pablo Escobar and the guy playing Ghost and all these people can buy all that stuff because they don't have to deal with the tax man. And in a legit industry, and it's illegal, so the profit, yeah. the price is up. Exactly. I, I was yeah. buying tomatoes today, and so I said to my my woman, I said, you know. You've seen those memes that they say they want to regulate cannabis like tomatoes, where everybody's allowed to grow tomatoes, but you can buy them at the store. That kind of overlooks that only four companies make all the tomatoes that you can buy at the store, you mm-hmm. know? And so, like, when you reach for that Heinz ketchup, that's Morningstar Farms. Right. They make, like, 40% of the tomatoes. It's owned by one guy. And so, like, uh, okay, you want uh, people to grow their own and then four companies to own the entire industry nationwide? I don't want it regulated like tomatoes. I want no. it regulated like craft beer, where you can have a brewery and that brewery's ownership. If you go down the road, to, I'm actually having one from a brick house brewery that's in Bourbon A. So if you go to Bourbon A, that's going to have a different owner than if you go down to Normal and go to a Steel. And right. so all these cities can support craft cannabis, but they don't. It's that ain't how they make tomatoes. Exactly. But I like how you use that example because craft cannabis is what came into the conversation at the end of this last legislative session. Mm. And most of the politicians had no freaking idea what that looked like. And I find that crazy because craft breweries have exploded in the state of Virginia. There's a craft brewery. My office is in an office park. I can walk out of here and make a right and go Mm. down Oh, there's a craft yeah. room there and one over here. I live in Peoria, Illinois. It is dinky. It's nice, but it's dinky. I get, we have one craft brewery there. Uh, there's another brewery down there. Uh, you can go across the river. There's another brewery. And mm-hmm. so, like, there's all these micro breweries. And they don't and you can... each other out of business. Exactly. And see, that right there, that understanding of an economic, uh, what I like to call the cannabis ecosystem in the state, Mm. That's what these politicians do not understand because they don't understand that if you allow the lower level operators to compete in the market, if they are a good business, then they will thrive. And that's quicker jobs than large corporations. They, there's some that's politicians- local money. It's yeah. local money, unlike large it's corporations. Where it's, that's shareholder money. It gets sucked out and sent to uh, Bettington, Arkansas. Politicians yep. That's what they want. They want to give cannabis to the big corporation and then the, their rationale is but then that way we don't have to deal with as many companies and the medical MSOs they're trying to give it to it's companies like Jack Daniels it's companies <laughs> like Altria you know because we're in the tobacco state fellas I can drive 60 miles west from where I am and I am in the tobacco capital of the country richmond virginia yeah. and therefore the world yeah I mean, yeah so if people don't understand how big tobacco still is yes people have cut back on smoking and not as many people are dying from lung cancer but it's still a big ass industry because the- they, it was broken down for me by someone who is an equity investor in cannabis that we have been talking to about putting money behind our social equity program the way he broke it down was altria who is here in the state of virginia has enough money off of last year's revenue where they could buy every cannabis company in the country and stroke a check and then next month recoup all of that fucking money in just sales Mm. now tell me that is not some scary (laughs) people not if i'm like hey hey excuse me while i go see if this altria company is traded on the stock market or not oh it is yeah, you go buy some shares. What do they do? They kill people. Okay. Yeah. But you know, it just because of show this the shitty regulation, the city legislatures, as far as like not understanding a plant. And, and if you're willing to like just that let is so important, man. People don't understand because they don't want to get educated. Well, the craft part too, it's an essential part to genetics, right? Like people forget, like, or don't understand like the potato famine. The reason why that happened is because the genetics became weak. They only had one fucking mm-hmm. potato they were allowed to grow over and over again. Whereas Say the cannabis, you can do some breeding and strains and like we're seeing with corn. Yeah, you know, exactly. you have Dow trying to control the corn population. You know, shoot, if they have, if they own all the corn seeds and they're genetically tagged, where they can tell that's Dow's corn, that's Del Monte's corn. Yeah, yeah, but they don't get it. They don't get it. And so, like, there, there's all these coffee farms in South America, right? And then uh, Americans know it just as coffee 
or Starbucks. Mm -hmm. But then they go down to a local roaster who fresh roasts that and you have it and you go, what the fuck is that? That's amazing. Right. So this freshness aspect of it, you can't commoditize that. No. I mean, like when you're making like sweet corn. See, now, you're, now you're getting into my wheelhouse because in in my boot camps, I beat my people over the head about understanding who your core customer is. Who's right. your target customer? You got to be able Very to important. always know who are you catering to that you're expecting to come in and support your business 50% of the time while you go after these other people. And when we've had these conversations, they've thought about it from a lot of different perspectives. And it's funny that you mentioned that because I was just having a conversation about a month ago with a woman that is a state executive in a government office. And she is also one of the first hemp farmers in the state of Virginia has run a successful business and she is a black woman. Those three things you don't really see in that yeah. position in the state of Virginia. And we were having a conversation because she had some ideas she wanted to share with me about creating equity in the cannabis space to be able to bring about a fair market quicker to basically suppress the legacy market because it's growing by like a billion dollars a year. Mm. You know? Well, the way you guys legalized it, you just said, go for it, legacy market. And then because of that, good luck getting that toothpaste back in the tube. You just got to figure out how to license them, in my opinion. But a lot of these politicians didn't understand. So I'm having this conversation with her, and she explains to me her philosophy is rather than have all these different independently owned dispensaries immediately next year for the first two years, have cultivators that can basically sell their prof their product through the ABC stores, the alcohol beverage. Hmm control which sells all the alcohol in the state of virginia it's all regulated by the state but she was saying the stores are already all over the place people know where they are they can trust the product blah 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 makes sense right mm -hmm. however when she's talking about this she starts talking about that's you know the sin industries and she's talking from that perspective so you can go to this one place if you want your jack daniels your absolute vodka your wine your your cannabis you can get it all right there and i had to stop her I said, that right there got my attention. Excuse me, madam, let me ask you this. Have you ever consumed cannabis before? No. And I told her, the reason I asked that question is because of the way you just responded tells me you have never, ever consumed real quality weed and you've never consumed real shitty weed. Because right. a person that has been a consumer, an aficionado who has developed a taste for what they like, in their body when they come across a dirt product they're like this is garbage they give yeah. it away and a lot of that product that's going to end up packed up in packs from altria like a cigarette like a pack of squares is going to be dirt because all the crystals and all has been beat to death you know mm, yeah. it's nice and neat and you can get it at the 7-eleven however that is not the same quality of product you get from the craft grower over there that when yeah. they're taking the bud out of the jar and putting it into your jar, you can put it up to the light and you can see that shit reflecting like a prism. Yeah. Right. <laughs> gas station coffee ain't coffee, you know? And so like <laughs> gas station, gas station weed, weed ain't weed. That ain't yeah. weed. You know what I'm saying? So that, that, but that process right there was what we, at the end of the legislative session, we started getting some politicians that have been anti-cannabis to start embracing that. And they're saying, wait a minute, that makes a lot of sense. Tell me more about that. And that's how we started doing the tours, because I don't know if uh, mm. Serena has told you, our organization uses the Columbia Care facility to do tours with pastors from the area. Those pastors have been the gateway to us talking about cannabis opportunity in the community. So hmm. this June 18th event, I got three pastors from three prominent churches in the area coming to participate in a panel because they came to the tour last month and they all said, before this tour, I had no idea of the type of jobs, the science involved, and hmm. how big this industry actually is. All of the people in the faith community that are dealing with families that are dealing with police issues, they're only hearing about their son being at a party or something, smoking a blunt, getting pulled over by a cop, 
you know, that's all they've gotten. So when they yeah. got introduced to us and they saw the other side of it, the pastor's like, oh, crap. You just opened my mind to a whole bunch of other stuff. And a couple of them actually now are interested in pursuing opportunity as a business owner because they realize it's something they can do with their kids. Yeah. The kids talking and they can never understand. But once they were sitting yeah. in a lab and they had at the Columbia Care Facility here in Portsmouth, the, the biochemist that runs that room is an African American scientist from Virginia State. Oh wow! He just hired an assistant from my alma mater that's got a chemistry degree, a master's chemistry degree, and so these pastors are sitting here in this room and they're like, "I would have never thought, Paul, coming to this facility, Paul, that this company actually applied social equity." And like 90% of the employees in the building are Hispanic or black mm. from the head pharmacist, chemist, all of that. They were blown away by that. But to be in this room and the lady was breaking down how she came from an agricultural family, third generation, and still has the family farm, but walked away from a big pharmacy company job to come work at Columbia Care. Mm. They gave her an opportunity to hire other people that looked like her. Oh, yeah. She jumped on it. And so that got their mind racing as to, okay, what else is out here? Mm. And that's been possible because of a company like Columbia Care. I know a lot of people have the medical MSOs. I hate a lot of them too because I've had people contact me over the last two years asking me to be a shill for them. Yep. Had an attorney. Well, just wait. Cresco bought Columbia Care. So just Somewhere. your phone will be ringing. I don't look like you. I can't. I can't. I'm sorry. It's uh, it's just not something that I can do. But uh, the other thing that you mentioned was all these people that have great resumes. And so I can give you a perfect application. I can't make you an astronaut. That's yeah. on you. So like if you have a great resume right. and you're what the state's looking for, you're going to win. Now, if you don't have a great resume and you're not what the state's looking for, your perfect application doesn't matter. You definitely need to. Okay. But a lot of people that a lot of people in my community, because I just got them talking to a couple hundred of them, they don't understand that. Well, first of all, people don't understand how any cannabis business actually functions. They're just thinking in terms of their local medicine man. Yeah. Call a number or send a text message to this ghost number. <laughs> Somebody sends a reply text. I'm outside your door. Well, that's yeah. that's all I, they know. So. I, yeah, your idea of what it's supposed to be like is so <laughs> fragmented. That's why we're making these events where it's like a combination of a concert and a, a TED talk, hmm. kind of like a little bit of a spiritual experience. Because that's what this community needs for people that one trust. Because yeah. a lot of people have trusted the system. Okay, we're going to give you a public defender. Oh, just stop to this, and we'll be easy on you. And then they do that shit and they're still in jail for seven years. Mm. Like, I would have took my chances, you know what I'm saying, going to court. But that's the kind of stuff, gentlemen, that the politicians have no understanding of. And that's why we're taking the approach of first, we're going to extend the hand and try and educate you and be polite. And then if that doesn't work, then we got to get, you know, real guttural and, and press the issue because. Yeah. Half the politicians in the state are up for election, and we—that's great. We plan to make everyone in those municipalities aware of how they can influence those elections, and which will influence their cannabis opportunity in those municipalities. Oh, absolutely! Because, like, yeah. the difference between an open market with craft cannabis and an Illinois or. Um, well, Illinois is like the most egregious offender with uh, um, limited market legalization adult use, mm -hmm. uh, except for maybe Washington State. But Washington State has more licenses than Illinois. Illinois has, they have 88 craft grow licenses. To set that thing up, 12 million bucks. You know, uh, that's ridiculous. Now, like that's uh, that's fully formed. I mean, we have a plan to get one set up for 2 million and have a dispensary next to it. But that's a much smaller canopy. And you still have to like say that you're going to do all this great stuff and you have, you know, astronauts and like people that can write a million dollar check on board. Man, the expectations for application have to be realistic to what the market demand will be in the beginning, as well as how the businesses can turn that, man. Because like you said, if you're going, I 
look, I used to be the guy selling money. I sold money as a banker and a real hmm. estate funder for 11 years. Okay. For somebody to go into a business and we're looking at evaluating this opportunity and they're saying, okay, it's going to cost me a million dollars up front, Paul, but I got no idea what I'm going to make on the back end because it's a completely untested market. It's all brand new. Okay. Let's do some math. We can figure some things out because you can stretch out your debt service make it more you know feasible but when you're talking yeah. like you said five million twelve million dollars anybody looking at that and saying okay we're gonna put 10 mil into this that shit better be a huge payoff you know in that yep. first year and not many businesses can do that even in the cannabis no and then yeah. the social equity it was like again the, in not, illinois totally but, but like it, it was 100 percent social equity 100 percent veteran owned uh, and then I've seen contracts where the social equity is immediately exited. Mm -hmm. And like, so you're like, okay, so why did you even put that in there if they could be immediately executed? You know, that, that just doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. But then the ones that they do get it, they have zero capital. They don't provide them any capital. And they're saying, well, where's your $12 million operation? Right. It's You can't, if you need the three things for the business, you can't give the person one or two and expect the other one just to materialize from the <laughs> in the oxygen in the air it doesn't happen like that in yeah. business if you don't go get it and put it in place it doesn't just show up in the states a lot of these states got these un okay it's like this man when we were talking about bringing cannabis this woman was talking about bringing cannabis to the state of virginia through abc mm -hmm. if i'm not mistaken i wrote a white paper two years ago and included that in part of my stats at the time, there was like 184 ABC stores in the state. Oh, shit. Just 84. 184. Oh, 184. God damn. Now, the other example we used were Starbucks, 7-Elevens, and nightclubs that had the ability to sell alcohol. There Ooh, were 184 many? Starbucks. In 484. The there were 3,000 clubs and restaurants that could <laughs> sell alcohol. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Right. 8.5 million people. So why the hell are you going to say we just need about 15 dispensaries spread everywhere? Yeah. Because the capital guy, the guys that are publicly traded are coming in. They're like, I want all of this, all of this mine. Yeah. See, that right there is what a lot of consumers uh, started to learn about in that la in that original work group process. Every one of the public uh, citizen testimonials that I saw in that process was a grandmother, 60 and older, usually white. And hmm. they're telling these politicians, my doctor keeps prescribing me this drug here for my anxiety. This shit makes me hallucinate where I can't drive and go pick my granddaughter up from school. But I can just smoke a J and I can actually have a part-time job because my anxiety is manageable. And I was listening to story after story after story like that. And those testimonials smack some of those politicians in the face. I mean, like a Chris Rock slap. It was <laughs> because the people that they have been trying to fear monger to oh. were sitting on this Zoom saying, I'm not scared of the black dude, you know, over there selling the weed. My yeah. grandson introduced me to that young boy and he brings that to my, <laughs> yeah. my medicine. You know what I'm saying? So the whole doom and gloom and let's push the fear that the politicians have been doing for so long with the war on drugs, yeah. the public has started to get, become aware of like, wait a minute, I get my cannabis from a young black guy. Yeah. Or I get my cannabis from an old, I know two, I know two people that used to be involved with uh, professions and state-based jobs where they carried a firearm on a regular basis and they are no longer in those jobs. And one of them is a medicine man. And both of them are daily consumers mm -hmm. and advocates. Right and they have talked about many other people on the force that manage their pain regimen with cannabis. But because they've used the doom and gloom and gateway drug nonsense for so long. You know, lies. Because they used lies to brainwash them. And then... The, the, the best way to keep a lie that you can brainwash people for decades is to make whatever that lie is crime.
Because if yeah. that that lie is a crime, it's so easy to keep it you down. You know. Well, it, and part of the gloom is the, the Sin City tax, right? To say uh, you're going to group it with uh, alcohol and, and right. cigarettes and everything else, but yeah, it is medicine, right? Even though it's right. recreational and, and and people are using That's it. Another thing politicians don't understand, dude. Yeah. I, I was listening to. I uh, there's a lady in our state named Doctor Peace. She was the state's leading toxicologist. Okay, she was the one that was doing all of the the high. The drug testing for the most high level crimes in the state of Virginia. She mm. was the person doing the testing. She's now in the private sector doing testing for cannabis operators and cannabis businesses. Mm. She understands the science of the plant and has, has does a presentation where she breaks that down and explains. Man, politicians watch that presentation like, oh shit, I did not understand that. I just learned something. And yeah, you're, you're I'm so used to being the one lying. I didn't realize <laughs> I was also being lied to. Yeah, it's like, yeah, now you get it. Now you understand why we get so pissed off when you say you're going to do something. You don't do it, Mr. Politician, man, right. or, or Ms. Politician, politician woman. How a plant, somebody can consume a plant when they come home from just a hard day of work and they just want to unwind just like they would have a glass of wine. And then that same plant can be consumed by someone else that suffers with PTSD. And that same plant could be consumed by somebody's grandmother that suffers from severe anxiety and they're all consuming the same plant for a different reason and they all get benefit from it. And politicians don't like that because they're so used to wanting to just put everybody into a category. Yeah. Like in the silo. And so we can just pick it apart. Cannabis is... And, then, and then politicians have never started a fucking business. Like, well, <laughs> I, I can say that. I can say that to like... 90% certainty. There's yeah. probably 10% of politicians that have started the business, like Mike Bloomberg. Sometimes it works, sometimes right. it doesn't. You know, it's, so it's a slightly different skill set. But, you know, one of the things whenever I talk to somebody who's running for office, I always ask him, like, what have you built? Right. Oh, I've, done, I've been an employee or a public servant. I'm like, no, 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 no. You're going to start regulating me and my companies that we have operating. What have you built? You know? <laughs> Right. And, that, and it's funny because when they have to admit that, yeah, I've never dealt with carrying payroll to make sure yeah. my people had money <laughs> given, even though I went without. So my people were covered. You know, what yeah, I'm saying? Though I dipped into my credit, you know, mm -hmm. like I or I help the, the social equity guy, you know, like they don't have any money, but they have a license. Well, I, let me help you. Let me let me take some money and then let's let's work it together to make a bigger business. But um you got to watch out in the cannabis industry. Oh, I mean, there's just, there's, there's a lot scammers. of cultures out there. There's yeah. a lot of people looking. There's a lot of malice out there. There's a lot of people that don't give a damn of other than I just want to get you on the hook so I can get your money. Yep, yeah. And, you know, it was funny because we, we, one of the days, the third day of our boot camp when we did our face to face session was investor day. And I had the boot campers. Uh, talk with a gentleman from Tora to our capital and right. they they were asking a ton of questions but the thing that got them was was that how he was breaking down what predatory investment looks like mm. these are the kinds of statements people say these are the kinds of actions you sit down for your initial pitch and after talking two minutes, the guy wants you to sign the contract exclusive right then and there. <laughs> you know, it's like there the look for these things. These are the tentacles, the claws coming out. And as we started teaching them that stuff, it was great because they had that in the back of their head when they were finishing their boot their business plans. So all of them have finished their business plans and now they're currently talking to investors. And we don't have an industry yet. Why am I doing this? Because I got people calling me that say, I want to help people. Do you have some people that got their stuff together? Mm. That's why we created the coalition. But with the conversation that they've had, they can now recognize that. So when some of these people that have been dealing in like flipping houses and dealing with shitty mortgages, <laughs> they've reached out to some of them because they've seen them at speaking engagements and stuff like that. And they hear the stuff coming out of these vultures' mouth, and they call me up and shoot me a text message. Hey, Mr. Paul, Paul, man, you were not lying. This is what <laughs> the guy said to me. And I asked him, did you really mean to say that? He didn't realize how insulting he was. You know? <laughs> oh, shit. 
So it, it's a process, man. And what we're trying to do really is focus more on educating the people out in the community more than the politicians, because politicians are going to come and go. Yeah. And if we educate the community of what it's supposed to look like. And then they understand how picking up that phone and making that two minute phone call enough pisses off enough people where they say, <laughs> we can't ignore these people anymore. And we're just not getting people in the community interested in doing that because they understand that can sec help secure a position in cannabis. You guys are losing out on so much money right now. Tourism money. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, that's what you guys are is a tourism place. Like, Shoot, man, we have, we have mountains, oceanfront, beaches, lakes, valleys, prairie. I mean, dude. It's a beautiful place, and mm -hmm. we have music festivals, tons of wine festivals. Yeah, still is the wine capital of the state, and none of that stuff can be tied to cannabis and cannabis type events because of where we are state wise. And that's why I'm trying to push, 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 push the community to get on board and to get educated. So when they get the tweet from us. When it's legislative season, we say, this is what you say. This is the script. This yeah. Local delegate, call them now. And call them twice a day for the next five days. And then if they vote for you, this is the problem that I have. I don't like to give the politicians money anymore until after I've seen their voting record. I'm like, hey, you want that? Well, yeah. let's see how this vote goes. Oh, because they're master panderers. Yeah, that's all they do. They ask for money. <laughs> they didn't start a business, so they are forced to dial for dollars. Right, and that's that's why most people in politics get out of politics. But you know, whatever. We could do this all day. Uh, Paul, I wanted to thank you so much for for coming on the program. Where can people get in touch with the Virginia Marijuana Cannabis Coalition? Man, real easy. You can check out our website at vmccequity.org. You can email me through there. You can join our newsletter. You can follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, you can also, if you got questions or you want to learn more, you can shoot me details of what you're interested in. And uh, on that site, people can learn about our upcoming events. They can learn about uh, we're launching membership at the end of the month. So we're going to ha start having some business development content. Some of the lessons that I did with the boot campers. Uh, I was a consultant for seven years before I started the coalition working with small business owners. So a lot of the biz dev stuff, we've converted it for a cannabis industry to start helping people be able to put some framework around their business ideas and get ready. So yeah, that website is the easiest place to check, check us out. VMCCEquity.org. Cool. Thanks, man. Thanks, man. Uh, Thanks. Maggie, how was your day? You look yeah. so tan now that you're back from Mexico. Well, you know, it's funny. I think it's like we're having this conversation. I was, Paul, I spent 10 days in Cabo, right, in Mexico. And uh, weed is legal. Drugs are legal in, in Mexico, but uh, no infrastructure. So, you know, it's so weird to, to, to live in a state that has legal weed. I couldn't get, wait to get the flower that I had here. But then, you know, I took a bunch of carts with me and got away with it, whatever. But just the fact, it's so sad and so frustrating to see, like, they're missing out on so... Like my people have grown cannabis for thousands of years, and yet you all suck at this. Like it's nothing but brick weed out there. It's like <laughs> somebody because it's such a good market, right? If you have good weed, you're gonna have the most phenomenal like like tourist type experience. You know, like Colorado's doing it mm -hmm. here, in Washington State's doing it. Different states are having their B and B four twenty experience stuff. I mean, it, it, this is a whole missing market, and again. All use is well wellness use, right? So, like, you know, if, if I drink less because I smoke a little more, I mean, it's People actually don't realize it. Yeah, because th that was one of the things I found interesting in those work groups. A lot of the politicians would talk about cannabis in the same vein as drinking alcohol. And one of the guys from uh, I forgot the agency that he's with, but he kept talking, oh driving drugs. You know, it's just like, oh god, yeah. You know, it's like, no, sir, because one of the things, because I, I just, you know, I was talking from a consumer perspective on a lot of things. I have friends that used to have a couple cocktails a night after work. Once cannabis became available to them, they no longer have the cocktails. They have, you know, they hit, take a bong hit, vape, dab something at the end yeah. of their day. 
which has allowed them to sleep better, which has allowed their body to feel better with, because they're not waking up with a hangover. They don't have the same liver issues and the kidney issues. And as a result, they're actually exercising. It's amazing. I mean, and it's like alcohol doesn't get people exercising. No, no. It gets people to take a day off exercising because I just can't today. I just yes. can't. <laughs> yeah, after the Super Bowl, people aren't going to work, you know, because they've been drinking right? yeah. Jägermeister shots and Jack Daniels. And, you know, that stuff wears on you. Cannabis is not the same. And that's why we have, that's why we started doing those tours to mm. encourage people to learn. And then once they learn, we encourage them to get medical cards. And if they don't, because one of the other things is we're launching a program for first time consumers. All right, on walk them through they pay for uh it's like 12 hours of content where we walk them through becoming a cannabis consumer they learn about the plant they learn about the different ways you can consume they learn about how the different ways you consume can impact you in different time frames mm. you, you don't want to consume in this way you you, you might want to consume in this way if you got these medical conditions and then we're looking to have some of the medical folks from the state that issue the cards talk about how if you take this category of medications, you need to take your edibles for sleep mm. at this time so you have, you know what I'm saying, explaining yeah. that stuff to people because I go, when I go to the medical dispensaries, it's always interesting with the first time person and once they've gotten through their education process and they're comfortable, I'll walk over and introduce myself. Do you mind if I just ask you a couple nosy questions? Because I run a cannabis advocacy group, right and I just like talking to new consumers. Yeah. They're all not they. They're always older than me, and they're just about always whiter Asian. <laughs> you're consuming for the first time at like seventy years old. Now think about Great. that. Think about Devil's what those people have been told about marijuana their whole. Yeah. Life. You know the devil's hey, it's gonna make <laughs> you do that, and now they've gotten to the point where they're they're willing to consider this. I'll give you a prime example. One of my board members, uh, he was telling us on our board member call about a month ago about the church mother. This woman is 82 years old. She was the oldest woman in this church. And they do, they have a, uh, a prayer vigil every Wednesday after Bible study. And George was telling us about after this vigil where they're praying for everybody and they couldn't come to the church that night, one of the ladies, this church mother, was telling them, hey, she had gone to her doctor earlier that day, and the doctor was telling her, hey, Miss Mary, I think you might want to consider going to one of those other medical type of places and look for you some medicine. Hmm. She's like 82 years old. She's like, what are you talking about? She's like, a, uh, a cannabis um, a cannabis dispensary. Yeah. Like, you mean marijuana? And he's like, yes, I think that would be a better way for you to treat your management of your pain for hmm. your arthritis and these other issues. So her medical doctor is telling her, you need to go down to the dispensary. So she tells the people <laughs> in that prayer group that night, okay? Damn. When she tells the people in the prayer group, George, who is a board member and also a family member, who's also a Vietnam vet. And he was the guy that went and arrested people in the field for smoking cannabis and locking them up during Vietnam. To where this guy is now a cannabis advocate here in the state for black and brown people. So he's telling us the story about this woman because when she mentions that her doctor told her to go to the dispensary, every one of the people in the group attacked her. No, oh, God! How dare you bring that up? You're talking. There's another reason I don't go to church. You know uh, of that reefer madness mentality and all of that damn. wrong information being preached for so long. This lady was so confused because she's like, "Y'all don't understand. My doctor told me to go do this. Yeah, He's telling me to stop taking these pills." And even still, now George. I told you what his background was. He said he was completely floored. So he stood up oh. to acknowledge, hey, I'm a member of the state's cannabis minority coalition. We've been researching this. This is what I've learned. I've never consumed. And what she's talking about, I got family members that are now consuming cannabis rather than taking pills. Mm -hmm. and brought them relief and better quality of life. And then the people were looking at him like, you're a traitor. <laughs> and he said he realized then the stigma of cannabis is going to be the thing 
that prevents so many minorities from taking advantage of this opportunity because they're going to be so stuck in that place of ignorance when the the doors are going to close. And by the time it's no longer there, then they're going to realize, hey, that's that thing that those guys were telling us about 10 years ago. (laughs) Yeah. You see the thing? That stigma, man, had those people attack the oldest woman in the church that they all have looked up to mm. and prayed with for years. And she, George said that moment, this is somebody that is a deacon in the church, that moment caused him to question the church in a Damn. way that he has never done before. And he realized the stigma of cannabis, like I've been telling my board members, the stigma of cannabis is going to be the leveling agent in the black and brown community because all the people that have been preaching doom and gloom and, hey, reefer madness and, hey, it's going to ruin your life and blah, 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 blah. Well, now it's legal. OK, <laughs> you don't feel like that when my when my dentist prescribes me Vicodin for getting my teeth pulled. Mm. Yeah. You, yeah. My daughter had four wisdom teeth pulled and they wanted to prescribe her like 24 Vicodin. What the fuck is wrong with you? She's 16. Fuck no. That's just how it is, man. But anyway, you know, I just wanted to we could we could go all day and say like Paul ever, man. It is a big keep it up. And we're gonna I'm gonna look into this uh the Virginia marijuana uh cannabis coalition so I can check out your guys' stuff. But you know, thank you for joining us. Uh great time. And when when more developments happen, we'll bring you on to keep uh keep us abreast of uh What's going Sounds on in Virginia? Good. When we get into the political season, we'll be able to update you about the fight because nice. we're looking to to fight some politicians' ignorance because there's some people that don't understand that it's medicine. There you That's go. right, man. It's All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap this up with uh, a moment of silence because I am I'm getting a haircut, so I will no longer <laughs> have a mullet. <laughs> so, uh, we're gonna go out with uh, so long, Kentucky waterfall. <laughs> oh my gosh! It, it's Life's it's dirty. on the outs. <laughs> moment of silence, I guess. Kinda, it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, oops, oops.